Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Grace Hayek, and on behalf of the Glencoe Public Library, I welcome you to our webinar, Fire in the Sky, Secrets of the Earth's Aurorae. Now, let me tell you a little bit about our presenter. The library is delighted to welcome back Dr. Shane Larson. Dr. Larson is a research professor of physics and astronomy at Northwestern University. He is also the associate director of Northwestern's CIERA, C I E R A, which is the Center for Interdisciplinary Exploration and Research. He works in the field of gravitational wave astrophysics, specializing in studies of compact stars, binaries, and the galaxy. Two of his areas of exploration are studying how the evolutionary history of the galaxy is imprinted in the stellar graveyard and learning how gravitational waves can be used to understand the universe that light cannot reveal. For details, please ask him and not me. <laughs> he works in gravitational wave astronomy with both the, the ground-based LIGO, L-I-G-O, which stands for Laser Interferometer Gra Gravitational Wave Observatory Project, and the future space-based detector LISA, Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. Dr. Larson grew up in Eastern Oregon. He earned a BS in physics from Oregon State University in 1991 and a PhD in theoretical physics from Montana State University in 1999. He is an award-winning teacher and a fellow of the American Physical Society. He currently lives in the Chicago area with his wife, daughter, and cats. He contributes regularly to a public science blog at writescience.wordpress.com. And while we call him Dr. Larson here, he, on Twitter, he is known as at Science Jedi. I will put those both into the chat as well. Now I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Larson. Thanks again for being here tonight. Well, thank you, Grace. Uh, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this I've been, uh, I've gave, been able to uh, give several talks at Glencoe uh, Public Library. And so it's always a great pleasure to come back and have the opportunity to chat with all of you. Uh, those of you who have listened to me talk before, you know one of the great pleasures in my life is that I'm both a professional astronomer and an amateur astronomer. And what that means in uh, for practical purposes is that I spend as much time sitting at my desk desk and working on astronomy with physics and telescopes and data and algebra and computers as I do spending time in my backyard looking up at the sky. And one of the great things about looking at the sky as an amateur is that it's not just all telescopes. It is all kinds of sky phenomena, all kinds of things that happen in the sky that you can see yourself, that you don't have to see through the eyes of professional instruments or through the eyes of NASA or listen to some astronomy professor uh, tell you all about them. And so our topic tonight, uh, the aurora or the aurora borealis, as many of you may know it, um, is is exactly one of those phenomena. So this is a, a very typical picture in my background here that you see of the aurora. And you'll see a lot of these tonight. One of the hardest things about giving a talk about aurora is uh, deciding which pictures of the aurora to show you. Uh, you can find many more than the ones that uh, I'm gonna show you tonight, but there are lots of them. Uh, so my email address is there. Uh, you can certainly reach out to me at Northwestern. Uh, we'll have plenty of Q&A tonight, but if uh, at some point, a couple weeks in the future, you suddenly wake up in the middle of the night and have a question you wished you had asked, my email is there and you can send me an email and I will do my best to point you in the right direction to find the answers. I'm sure if you go in and see Grace at the library, they probably also have plenty of books at the library on this topic that will help you. There's a link to my uh, blog. It's meant to be a public science blog. As I tell people, I write it so my mom knows what I do. Uh, and then my social media is there as well. So if you tweet at me, I'll tweet back at you. Okay, so what I want to do tonight uh, is uh, I want to talk about the Aurora Borealis and the Aurora Australis. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, just kind of what they are, what we visually mean and what we're speaking about. We'll talk a little bit about the physics behind them, something that we often call the Sun-Earth connection. Uh, and then I'll close out right at the very end by talking about the fact that this is not a phenomena that is unique to the Earth. You can, in fact, see aurorae on on other worlds, okay? So most of us have grown up or heard about the aurora, if you haven't seen them, uh, in this context, the so-called aurora borealis. 
So Aurora is a word that comes from our ancient languages that means dawn. It was originally used to mean uh, the, so Aurora is the name of the Roman goddess of the dawn, to mean that kind of brilliant color that we get right before uh, sunrise. But when we say the Aurora Borealis, we talk about what you see in this image, which are these fantastical colored lights that we can see in the sky, primarily at the northern latitudes for those of us who live in the northern hemisphere. As it turns out, you can see the same thing at deep southern latitudes if you live in the southern hemisphere, and we call these uh, dawn lights in the sky, these aurora, the aurora australis. And so they are the exact same phenomena, the exact same effect, uh, but they are uh, visible in the southern hemisphere rather than the northern hemisphere, okay? So these images I'm showing you are very typical of the way they appear in photography. I'll show you some examples later on of what it'll look like to your eye. But what you see in these images are um, exemplary of what the aurora appear as. They are very high in the sky. They appear behind things we know are in the sky, so namely the clouds. But they also appear in front of things that we know are outside the Earth's atmosphere, so the stars the moon, the planets. They are colored very often, and they have a wide variety of colors. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Um, and then they also vary greatly in shape and form, and that has a lot to do with the physics of how they're produced. Okay, so these kind of uh, curtains that you see going straight up are one kind of classic example. Now, uh, for those of you who have seen the aurora, you uh, men, most of us who have seen them, we've seen them from the ground. Uh, my wife is from Alaska, so she's one of the few people I know who have seen them from airplanes. But you, you can see the aurora virtually anywhere on Earth if you have a good enough vantage point. So this is a picture of the Earth's aurora taken from the International Space Station. So the space station is above the aurora, looking down on them. And from this perspective, you can very clearly see that the aurora is happening in the atmosphere of the Earth. And this, in fact, is one of the uh, early mysteries of the aurora, which is where were they? Were they above the Earth's atmosphere? Were they connected to the Earth? Or were they connected to phenomena outside? And so uh, we know now they are, uh, in fact, the reason they appear is because the Earth has an atmosphere. And uh, the colors have to do with what the Earth's atmosphere is actually made of. Now, you and I are used to engaging with the aurora, of being aware of the aurora through the magic of photography. So everything I've shown you up to this point um, has been a photograph, a thoroughly modern photograph of the aurora. They're very high resolution. They're very good color quality. Um, but the aurora have, in fact, been known by humans for very long times. Um, it is uh, found in ancient Chinese records, uh, three thousand years ago, uh, there are records of the Chinese seeing the aurora. Uh, the indigenous cultures, particularly in the northern parts of North America, uh, in uh, Finland and Sweden and the, the Nordic countries, there are ancient oral traditions of seeing the aurora. Uh, but the kind of modern written record of Aurora didn't begin until uh, after the Renaissance sometime. And indeed, for a long time, people would describe what they had seen, but they didn't have the magic of photography to capture it, to kind of spread the word around and generate interest and get people to contemplate what these phenomena might actually be. That changed in the 1800s when uh, exploration, particularly in the Arctic, became very common. Uh, so this is a picture by Frederick Edwin Church. So you can see this picture. It's in the Smithsonian collection. It is an oil painting of the aurora. Uh, Church, uh, remarkably, what strikes me uh, <laughs> just as most amazing about this photograph is he did not witness this himself. This was actually derived from a report of an Arctic explorer named Isaac Hayes, who had been a pupil of Church's uh, and then became a very uh, prominent explorer of the Arctic region. And so Hayes had gone into the northern reaches of the uh, polar area and had written down a um, 
uh, a uh, recounting of seeing the aurora in his journal. And so Church took that, uh, that accounting and painted this picture, uh, which is very famous. Um, Church is a well-known landscape artist. And so if you go look at many of his landscapes that he's done, uh, he's famous for painting waterfalls and you know just all kinds of really uh, remarkable paintings where he catches that kind of diaphanous, ephemeral nature of clouds and water and such things. And so the Aurora, even having never seen them, I think he did very well in this picture at capturing something that to those of us who have seen the aurora in real life uh, very very well captures that kind of um, ethereal nature that the aurora borealis have so this was this was this this kind of era here in the mid 1800s was the kind of first opportunity where people began to see quote unquote, the aurora in these kind of colored contexts uh, through through the magic of paintings. Now, the very first photographs of Aurora happened not, not long after the invention of photography. So that this is the very first picture of an Aurora ever taken. It was taken in 1892 by a German named uh, Odo Brendel. Uh, and it is uh, very much like the quality of early pictures that you can see. For those of you who have looked at uh, early photographs, or, uh, early uh, daguerreotypes, or any of that kind of early photography that was done on plates and the emulsions, this is very typical of the kind of quality that those pictures were. And so you could imagine that if you had not seen this with your own eyes, you might have just thought it was some kind of artifact or flaw or accident that was so common in those early days when we were first learning how to take photographs with these kind of new materials and new techniques and new technology. But having seen the aurora, right, you and I have the advantage of looking at this photograph with the pictures of real auroras in our minds. And what what's, I think is amazing about this photograph is when I look at it, I'm like, wow, you know, that's, that's pretty good for the very first picture of aurora. But you can imagine that if I was Odo here and I was showing this around at a dinner party to my friends who had never seen the aurora, they might be skeptical <laughs> of whether or not I was actually seeing something in the sky or whether or not this was a flaw in this kind of bizarre new hobby called photography that I've picked up. Okay, but nonetheless, uh, aurora photography did advance. Uh, photographs got better, and so photographs of the aurora themselves also got better. Now, the first color photos of Aurora were not taken until the 1950s. So uh, the earliest pictures that are known uh, are by this uh, gentleman, J.R. Ayerman. Uh, so this is, uh, so there was in the early 1950s when color photography first started on the Aurora. And so this particular picture is taken from a spread that appeared in Life magazine in the mid 1950s. And so you can, uh, you can find digital archives of that Life magazine and see um, uh, many of those photographs that were taken in that era. Uh, a lot of them are like this. Uh, it doesn't show nearly that kind of crisp, uh, very sharp rendition of the auroras that uh, we're, we're used to in auroral photography today, but it does capture the structure, it captures the color, it captures that kind of misty, diaphanous nature that aurora have when you see them in the sky. And so arguably, this era here in the 1950s, it was right at the beginning of the space age, people were thinking about the sky a lot, um, technology was putting images and pictures in people's hands that they had never had before. This was probably the beginning of kind of really general and broad public awareness as well as public interest in being able to see the aurora for themselves. So uh, this is a great article in life. If you can find it in the archives or find a digital copy of it, uh, you should certainly go and look at them. Okay, so this is all, I think, uh, just a way of introducing something that many of us have been exposed to. Um, we've probably heard about this from friends who have seen them themselves. Maybe we've taken a trip uh, to Alaska or northern Canada and had the great opportunity to see them, Iceland. Um, but, uh, but for many of us, we've never seen the aurora except in pictures. 
Okay, and many of you are on Zoom tonight. Those of you who use Zoom backgrounds like I do, I have a picture of an Aurora here in the background. One of the default Zoom backgrounds is of the Aurora Borealis. So it, it has captured, it has settled into our collective consciousness as a cool phenomena in the universe that you can see up above your heads and is not beyond the ability of ordinary folks like me and you to go out and see. So let's use that as a question then, right? I want to see the Aurora. If you've never seen the Aurora, for many of us, this is a dream. Okay, I've seen the Aurora, so I'll tell you a little bit about that later. But what do you do if you want to see the Aurora? Okay, well, you can certainly book a trip to Yellowknife in Canada and, and, and go up in February, take your parka and stand out at night and see the Aurora. Okay, that's definitely one way to do it. But as it turns out, you don't have to do that, right? You can actually see the Aurora from right here where you live in the United States. But you have to be able to look at the right time and you have to be able to know that tonight will be a good night to go try and see it or maybe I should try some other night. So let's talk about what you personally would have to do to see the aurora from where you live. OK, so I'm going to I'm going to describe to you the, the kind of thought process, the planning that would go into it. But there's actually physics behind this. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the physics later. So I'm going to start with what do you have to see uh, to do to see the Aurora? But then we'll talk about the physics that describes why this is the this is the way it goes. OK, so if you get on to most major weather sites, um, there are apps for your phone. Uh, there are probably apps for your computer as well. You can get um, uh, uh, applications or websites that will give you what's called an Aurora forecast, just like a weather forecast. What are the chances that you'll go out tonight and see the Aurora wherever you are? Okay, so very typically those auroral forecasts will show you something that looks like this. Okay, so we're in the United States. So this one is captured from the United States projection. So you'll see uh, the map of the world there below. There is a uh, kind of a bright blue near the top and dark blue near the bottom. The line that separates those two, that is the day night separation. Okay, that's what we call the terminator in astronomy. Uh, and then you'll see that kind of green crescent shaped moon. Okay, so that's called the Aurora Oval. That is the place on the earth at this moment where the Aurora are the most intense. There's a little color bar down there at the bottom. Okay, and it shows uh, in increasing color from black all the way to white where the Auroras are going to be the most likely and the strongest. There's an additional little red line that you can see out there uh, that is not exactly on top of the oval. And that is the line where if you are standing between the green aurora oval and that red line, then you should still be able to see the aurora because it happens up in the sky. So you can stand far away and look up in the sky. And as long as it hasn't gone over the horizon of the earth, because the earth is curved, uh, then you should be able to see it. OK, so in this case, you'll see here we're in Chicago right now, or most of us are in Chicago right now. Does my mouse work? It does. OK, so we for this particular auroral event, OK, we are far south of the red line where we might be able to see the aurora. But if you live in northern Montana, North Dakota, Minnesota, the upper peninsula of Michigan, then on this particular night, people who went outside, provided it was clear, would have been able to look to their northern sky and seen the aurora, okay? So this line and this oval are not static. It changes. Sometimes it's much smaller than it is here, and sometimes it is much larger. There have been opportunities to see the aurora here in the United States as far south as Arizona, okay? So what happens? Well, when that happens, the aurora forecast changes. There is usually a ranking. It's kind of like a storm ranking for the aurora activity. It's this KP scale that they say. And so these lines overlaid here on Canada and the United States show that given the intensity of the aurora forecast, then you can see the aurora from different latitudes, different north-south positions across the entire continent of North America. 
So that one that I just showed you, that's a kind of typical KP3 auroral storm. So only the northernmost people here, the folks in Canada, but the northernmost people here in the United States would be able to see the aurora at that kind of average KP3 uh, rating that we see. But there are events, and we'll talk about this in a minute, that's part of the Sun-Earth connection, when the aurora get very strong and the entire northern hemisphere has the opportunity to see the aurora. And so if we have a KP6 storm, right, almost the entire state of Illinois would be able to see the aurora, provided it was not cloudy wherever they were standing on that night. OK, so one of the things you'll see when you go to these aurora forecasts and actually I don't see it written here on this particular one, but many of them have that KP number written right on the map as well. And I don't see it here, but sometimes they do. So they will they will they will mark that KP value and then you can kind of know, you know, anytime it's KP six or below in my area, I'll definitely be able to see the aurora. OK, so this is what those auroral forecasts will do for you. They'll tell you, should you stay up late tonight? Should you set your alarm? Should you go out and look? Will you have a chance to see them or not? OK, now I am sidestepping one important fact, which is I live in the city of Chicago. So even if we were having an enormous auroral event, a KP6 storm, I should totally be able to see the aurora. But if I step outside in the city of Chicago, then the light from the city is going to be so strong that I will not be able to see the faint light of the aurora in the sky. So when we have big rural events where I should be able to see these things in Chicago, I have to get in my car and drive out of the city. And we're very fortunate here in Illinois. We have a lot of great state parks. You can get out uh, away from Chicago in a couple of hours, or you can drive north into uh, the southern parts of Wisconsin. And as long as you're away from city lights, if there's a big rural event going on, you will have the opportunity to see the aurora. Okay. Okay, now related to that is most people want to take pictures. Okay, so these are two examples. So I told you I've seen the aurora before. So these were taken by a friend of mine, David Benoise. He and I are both amateur astronomers. So this is when I lived in Montana. So both of these were taken in the state of Montana in the year 2000. Okay, and so you can see we were in Bozeman. So this is one of these KP4 storms. So so that was the size of the storm that allowed us to see it living in Bozeman. And these are both pictures that he took with his 35 millimeter camera. Okay, so these are uh, very typical of what the aurora looked like during those storms. They're those kind of spiky curtains that point up at the sky. We saw red ones and we saw green ones. And this happened all the time that year. We saw the aurora so many times that year, it wasn't even funny. And so we were out observing. This is actually a telescope poking up right here. Uh, we were out observing and David's like, oh man, it's getting cloudy up there. And you look north and we're like, nope, that's not clouds. That's the aurora borealis. And so he, uh, he shot these really fantastic pictures of them. Now, most of you will be like, yeah, these are awesome. So you should absolutely just take the opportunity and look. Enjoy the fact that you're seeing this remarkable natural phenomena that doesn't happen all the time and that not everyone gets to see. Don't forget to just take the time to appreciate it and stare at it. OK, but then everyone wants to take a picture because, you know, you want to send it to your mom and say, Mom, I saw the Aurora Borealis. And you want to brag with it with your uh, friends at work yesterday and say, what were you doing last night sleeping? I was out seeing the Aurora. Right. You want to have a picture of it. OK, so what does it take to take a picture? So I will preface this by saying I'm about to tell you what you need to do to do it with a camera. But just in the last year or two, smartphones are getting good enough that I'm pretty sure you might be able to take a picture of Aurora with your smartphone. And we have not had an Aurora event that I've been able to see yet since, my, since I got my new smartphone. So I don't know how well that's going to work, but you should experiment or, or Google around. Someone will have some good advice for you. But let me tell you what the conventional wisdom for ordinary cameras is okay so the conventional wisdom is you need a tripod and that's because if you want to capture pictures like these ones that i'm showing right here you have to open that lens up for 
10, 20, 30 seconds. And you can't hold it still enough in your hand if you don't have it on a tripod. Okay, so put it on a tripod, focus at infinity. For those of you who are photographers that mean, or aren't photographers, that means just focus it as far away as you can. And then there are a variety of settings for how long you should do your exposure. And typically that depends on how hard the aurora are to see. If they're really faint, you probably need longer exposures for them to show up on film. If they are moving very rapidly, then you probably want really short exposures so that it doesn't just turn into a big green blur like you see there in the bottom, bottom image here. Uh, those of you who are uh, photography nerds, higher ISOs will certainly uh, see fainter things in the sky, but you'll get grain in your photographs. So both of these pictures that David took, this was before we had digital DSLRs. Uh, and so you can see, especially in that top photograph, the grain uh, there in the photo, because we were shooting at ISO 1600 or something, just really super grainy film. OK, and then my last bit of advice is just experiment. One of the beauties of doing this digitally in the modern age is you, you don't have to just shoot 24 pictures and then wait until they develop to see if you got a picture of the Aurora. If you're doing this with your DSLR, you can just shoot pictures, shoot pictures, shoot pictures, and you're going to get some cool ones. But that means take the opportunity to play around with your camera settings and see what kind of remarkable pictures you can capture, because every Aurora picture you take will be different than every other Aurora picture you take because they're constantly changing as we'll see here in a moment. Okay, so that's just kind of my introduction to this. Um, Grace, are there any questions that we should take before I start talking about what causes all of this to happen? There are a couple of questions. Okay, I'm happy to try and answer those before we go on, yeah. Uh, Bob asks a question that I was asking myself, which is um, back when you uh, showed the, the, the green Aurora arc, uh -huh. It was uh, shaped like a horseshoe, and it seems like you want to make it a full circle, you know, to circle. Yeah. The oh, why is that? That's a great question. So, so, so the, a little bit of detective work here, I think, will give you the answer. So you remember I told you this line right here that separates the bright blue from the dark blue is what we call the terminator. It separates the day night from the night side of the earth. And so over here, it's daytime, and you can't see the aurora in the daytime. So, so that's the that's the key reason. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, um, Shelly and Jim uh, are asking, what's the best time to view the aurora? Middle of the night? Can, can you do it right after dinner? Do you have to? Yeah, get no, that's a morning? that's a great question too. So, so as a general rule, middle of the night is better than uh, earlier in the evening or early in the morning, and that's because the sky starts to brighten up many hours before the sun actually rises, or or, or for many hours after the sun sets. It's not fully dark at any location on the Earth until a couple of hours after uh, sunset or. Uh, a couple of hours before sunset. And so generally later in the evening when it's full dark is going to be better. Um, here you can see uh, the Aurora Oval is fatter uh, right here in the middle. So this is kind of roughly midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., right? And that's because this is as far away from the daylight as you can get. And so it's darkest here. And so the, the Aurora show up much better. Now, that being said, if you want to see the Aurora, you really just, you got to go when they're visible. And so I will tell you all the way we did this when we lived in Montana. Um, so we we didn't have, uh, so this was in 2000, right? So this is before, you know, um, you know, Facebook was popular and all that sort of stuff. We didn't have social media or any of that stuff. So we, we, we made what we called an Aurora calling tree. So we, we, we asked all of our friends, we said, who wants to definitely see the Aurora this year? And so we all got, and then we broke ourselves into two groups. Who, who wants to see the Aurora at an hour uh, which they will still get plenty of sleep? And who wants to see the Aurora no matter what? Okay, and we divided, I think it was 11 p.m. at night. And so what we did is we, we wrote all our names down in a circle with our cell phone numbers. And if any one person on the list saw the Aurora, they called the next person on the circle and then they went out and saw the Aurora. And the person who got the call called the next person on the circle and then they went out and saw the Aurora. And it just went around and around until it got back to the person who started the calling circle, okay? And so all of us saw the Aurora like 10 or 15 times that year uh, because all of us were like, yeah, wake me up at any hour of the night. There's, I totally wanna to see the Aurora. And so we saw the Aurora at 10 p.m. We saw the Aurora at 2 a.m. It just 
whenever it happens, you got to go look. And so you need someone to tell you it's happening. So you know to go out and see it at the right time, because it's not a constant phenomena. It's constantly changing. It gets brighter, it gets dimmer, even over the course of a night. Okay, especially down here where we live. If you're like up in Yellowknife in, in, in uh, the Northwest Territories, you know, they're going to be on all night up over your head. But, but down here where we are, yeah, you got you to take the opportunities when they happen. It's not like an eclipse where you can say, okay, it's time. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's not like that at all. It's not predictable. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. A couple more questions. Okay. Yeah, let's okay. a couple more. Um, okay. Laura asks, do the forecasting apps do any projections? Uh, yeah, so so there's a whole bunch of different ones. And so I don't know all of the kind of different capabilities of what they have. So so one, I think the one I took this one from, this one's actually measuring Aurora from satellites, right? So this is this is why this map here is so um, um, uh, uh, keen on, on, on daylight and, and nighttime mapping. Uh, but many of the auroras do do predictions, and we'll talk about why that is. It's based on knowing what the sun is doing. And so those of you who have lived through this many times will know sometimes on the news, they say, oh, tonight might be a great opportunity to save the aurora, and that's because they're doing the forecasting. And so some of the apps do indeed do that. They do the forecasting. They look at the weather in space, as we call it, the space weather, the sun or weather um, and then they make a prediction for whether or not tonight will be a good night or not so okay well there are more questions but let's get to them later and, and okay carry on with okay the, yeah. yeah we'll take plenty we'll, we'll make sure we spend plenty of time at the end answering questions thank so. you so let's let's talk about some physics what causes the aurora okay well there's basically three things that are going on you need the sun you need the magnetic fields, which are connected to the earth, and you need a little bit of atomic physics, okay? And I'll, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about all of them. So all of this really begins with the Sun-Earth connection. And it, it was speculated, especially if you go back to the early speculation about Aurora, that the Sun was somehow involved, although it was not understood how. But especially once we began to observe the Sun and we began to understand that the Sun itself goes through cycles and has changes and it's a dynamic object itself, people often speculated about whether or not the Aurora were connected to the Sun. And and that's because we are intimately aware that there is a deep connection between the sun and what goes on here on Earth. It drives our weather, it drives our seasons, it is responsible, it's at the base of the energy chain for all life on Earth. We are intimately connected to the sun. And so anytime we think about kind of global phenomena, things that can be seen on wide scales across the entire planet, then we often turn to, okay, well, the sun affects the entire planet. Could this somehow be connected to the sun? Okay, and so the Sun-Earth connection was something that early on uh, people speculated about. It took us a long time to understand that indeed the Sun was connected to the Aurora, but that, that intuition that it might be was in fact correct. Okay, so for those of you, Grace mentioned the eclipse here a minute ago. So for those of you who saw the eclipse in 2017, uh, you were uh, able to see the corona of the sun. So this is uh, um, one of the many remarkable pictures to come out of the eclipse. This was taken by uh, Jerry Lodgris uh, at astropix.com, who's a really great astrophotographer. Uh, you can see planets there, those kind of bright stars off to the left and the right are Venus and Mercury. Uh, but there in the center is the sun, completely covered, uh, occluded, as it were, by the moon between us and the sun. But streaming out from the sun are these very long rays, okay? So that's called the solar corona. And the solar corona is a very dynamic place. It has a lot of interesting physics and a lot of dynamic structure, which you can see in this picture. There's a lot of what we call in the biz plasma, which is a gas that's been broken up into its charged constituents that is migrating around in the solar corona. Okay, now most of us in our everyday lives don't get a chance to observe the corona. Uh, during events like eclipses, we certainly get the opportunity but astrophysicists watch it all the time with satellites. So this is uh, from NASA Heliophysics Division. So this is an X-ray movie of the sun. 
Okay, so you can see the surface of the sun down there at the bottom. You can see it is a frothing, boiling mess of stuff going on all the time. Those little features you can see down here, uh, many of these are kind of the size of the Earth or so. It takes about 100 Earths to fit all the way across the sun to give you a sense of the scale. But up above the sun, you see this sort of stuff going on all the time. So this thing here, it, there's an Earth for scale, okay? This thing here is called a solar prominence, okay? And you'll notice it's very curved structure. We're gonna come back to that curved structure here in a moment. That curved structure is actually magnetic fields on the sun. And when this plasma and the corona gets launched up into the uh, atmosphere of the sun, basically, it is captured by those magnetic fields. And what you can see happening in this movie is it begins to rain down on the sun, guided by those magnetic fields back down towards the surface of the sun. This image is taken in x-rays, which your eye cannot see, uh, but we use the magic of technology to turn it into an image and uh, use colors that your eye can see. So this red palette uh, is uh, the lowest energy is in red, but then places where it's yellow and bright white, those are the strongest energies. So these are very energetic, very hot events on the surface of the sun. Okay, and you can spend hours just staring at these uh, these prominence movies that the folks on the sun, uh, that the folks on the sun, that the folks who study the sun uh, take pictures of all the time. And there's a lot of kind of current modern astrophysics that goes in trying to understand exactly what's happening when we stare at events like this. Okay, now let me show you a slightly different movie of one of these events. So you can see right there in the foreground, there's one of those uh, prominences, but you see suddenly, rather than everything raining back down onto the earth, it launched itself, it exploded outward and expanded outward into space. Okay, so these kinds of events are these enormous solar storms that happen when they eject enormous amounts of matter like that. It's usually called a coronal mass ejection, a CME. Okay, so this is all material from the sun that's suspended up in the corona in that area above the sun that we've been talking about, and that mass is ejected from the sun out into space, okay? And sometimes those CMEs, like this one, just kind of go off into the wild blue yonder, off to the left or the right or the bottom or the top or behind the sun, but every now and then they are directed straight at us here at Earth. And so here's an example from uh, this um, uh, instrument on SOHO called LASCO. That CME, you'll see it gets blasted out to the side there, but when the CME comes directly at the Earth, it will illuminate on every side. And you can see there the faint cloud going in every direction. That's a sign that that CME is coming towards us. There's lots of material that used to be a piece of the sun that's been blown out into space and is on its way to Earth. Now, a minute ago, someone asked, um, do we make aurora forecasts? And the answer is yes, we do. And it's based on these kinds of observations. When something like this is launched off the sun, it takes some amount of time, typically a day or more, to get from the sun to the earth. And so we know it's coming. And so part of the sun monitoring program that we have on earth is watching the sun all the time, trying to uh, be aware of whether or not it's throwing one of these giant solar storms at us, okay? Now, in addition to this, there is also a constant wind that is being blown off the sun, okay? That's actually, every star has a stellar wind. This is called the solar wind. And what it is, is it is particles that are uh, in the sun's atmosphere, uh, on the surface of the sun, and they happen to be energetic enough that they will slowly bleed away from the sun. They have enough speed to get away from the sun's gravity and they stream out into the solar system in every direction. And so the earth and all the planets are constantly being bathed in this solar wind. It is not nearly as dense as the coronal mass ejections that uh, I just uh, uh, showed you movies of, but it is a constant flux, a constant stream of particles, largely electrons, uh, charged, charged particles coming from the sun. 
Okay, and so right here in the center of this image, you'll see the Earth, and we're going to talk about this kind of bow shock that you see around the planet right here. Okay, so some of you may remember from your physics class playing with bar magnets. Uh, some of you may not, and if you don't, you can certainly uh, get a bar magnet and play play at home with uh, what I'm about to show you here. So this is a movie where we've taken a bar magnet and put it on a piece of paper, and then we've put a plastic uh, Tupperware lid over the top of it. And what we're going to do here is we're going to sprinkle uh, iron filings, right, which you can collect with the magnet out of your sandbox in your backyard over the uh, top of the plastic that's covering the magnet. And what you should notice is look how the filings don't just fall in a big pile. They align and orient themselves in a very precise and well-known shape in physics, okay? So this shape is called a dipole. It's kind of arched in the middle and on the ends, it looks like it's kind of radiating outward. Okay, uh, and this is very typical of what the, the structure around magnets looks like. Okay, now I'm gonna, I, I've done a better picture of this. Okay, so this is uh, on a piece of paper to make it stand out well. Okay, so on this picture, there's a magnet underneath the piece of paper, and it makes these very pretty, uh, pretty magnetic fields. Okay, so these are these iron filings just lined up. But what, you, what I want you to imagine is imagine that the bar magnet is inside the earth. Okay, as it turns out, the earth has a magnetic field that looks just like the magnetic field of a bar magnet. In fact, it's that magnetic field that makes your compass work when you take out your compass when you're hiking and it always points to the north. Your compass is following one of these curved lines which runs from the south side of the earth all the way to the north side of the earth. But it's exactly the same shape and structure as that magnetic field that belongs to the bar magnet. Okay, so what does this have to do with the aurora? Well, you'll remember that I said the earth is bathed in those charged particles from the sun. And you'll also remember that when we're talking about the aurora ovals, they are concentrated up here in the north part and down here in the south part of the earth, which is where all these magnetic field lines come into the planet. So one of the things that we know in physics is that if I have charged particles, just like those particles that we see in the solar wind, when they encounter a magnetic field, it's like a sidewalk. They can't resist the magnetic field and they follow the magnetic field until they crash into something. And in this case, that thing that they crash into is going to be the Earth and the Earth's atmosphere. Okay, so in that picture I previously showed you of the solar wind streaming past the Earth, the reason the particles were deflecting around the Earth is because the Earth's magnetic field is creating this little bubble around the planet. And if the particles are too far away, they go streaming past the planet. But for those that get close enough, they follow these magnetic field lines down to the Earth and into the Earth's atmosphere. And the place where they cross into the Earth's atmosphere is the place where we see the aurora ovals. So this is a picture of the aurora australis, the southern aurora oval. You can see it encircling Antarctica right there. This is where the magnetic field from the Earth enters around the continent of Antarctica, okay? So the reason we have aurora is because the Earth has a magnetic field that guides charged particles in, and then there is a source of charged particles in outer space, namely the solar wind and these big solar uh, storms that the sun uh, has when it throws off these coronal mass ejections, okay? Now, what about the colors? Okay, so those of you who remember your uh, chemistry class or maybe your physics class in high school or college will remember that uh, one of the things that helped us learn about all the different atoms on the periodic table and how they're different is that every atom has a unique set of colors 
that it emits, kind of a fingerprint, just like you have a fingerprint on your thumb, right? Atoms have a fingerprint in the colors of light that they like to emit. So the aurora color comes from the particles that get hit by the electrons, the charged particles, when the magnetic field guides them into the Earth's atmosphere. So the charged particle comes in, it hits some particle, some molecule in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, as we say in the biz, that molecule gets excited. It absorbs a whole bunch of energy from the fact that it had that collision but it can't hold on to that energy forever. Eventually it calms down. And the way it calms down is it gives off light and it gives off light in those specific colors that are unique to the particular molecule that you're talking about. So when we look at Aurora and you look at Aurora pictures like the one behind me, you often see that the colors are separated. And if we look carefully, we see that the colors seem to come from different altitudes in the Earth's atmosphere. So if I combine these two pieces of information, the height that the color is coming from and that the color itself is related to the molecules that happen to be emitting the light, what I can see is that the colors of the aurora are related to the dominant atoms that you can find in different parts of the Earth's atmosphere. So you get those very reddish and pink colors from oxygen, you get bluish and purplish colors from nitrogen, and you get greenish colors from oxygen. Okay, so the colors that we see in the aurora are unique to the particular mix of gases that we see here in the Earth's atmosphere. Okay. Now, the aurora borealis are not visible all the time. Okay. Um, and this is because of what we said that the source of charged particles that are providing the impetus for the creation of the aurora. The charged particles that are streaming into the Earth's atmosphere to cause the aurora borealis in the sky, they come from the sun primarily, okay? And one of the things that we learned a long, long time ago is that the sun has these kind of cycles that it goes through, these 11 year cycles where it is sometimes very quiet as in up here at the top of the uh, image, this kind of blackish ball with just a few little orange spots. That's what we call the quiet sun. So during this time, there are not a lot of those solar prominences that we saw. Uh, those of you who do solar observing uh, with your telescopes, there are not a lot of sunspots, right? The sun's just kind of very quiescent and calm. Okay, but on an 11 year time scale, it goes from this very active state, uh, sorry, this very quiet state to the active state and, and back again. And so when the sun is very active, okay, then you see lots of those prominences. The sun is a churning, boiling uh, cauldron of activity. The uh, uh, coronal mass ejections happen very often. And then we get many of these big events that lead to these auroral storms that we can often see even when we live down here in the southern parts of the continent. Now, the most recent, whoops, I went the wrong direction. The most recent quiet time, the recent solar minimum, as we say, happened in about 2019, okay? So the sun was over here in its quiet spot and it's been slowly, steadily starting to get more active. Okay, so for those of us who are amateur observers, right, if you have a solar telescope and you go out and look at the sun, the thing that you begin to notice as the sun gets more active is you begin to see more sunspots. Okay, for uh, professional astronomers who have X-ray satellites, they see that the sun begins to get more active and you start to see these really active, bright regions where you see those prominences that we saw movies of. Okay, so the sun is heading towards its active state and the next expected maximum is going to be in about 2025. Okay, so for those of us who are keen on seeing the aurora, this is a great time to start thinking about how am I going to make sure I get a chance to see the aurora, because the number of opportunities to see the aurora are going to increase for the next four or five years because the sun is getting more active. Okay, so this is a great time to be thinking about your aurora, uh, your aurora plans, because it's going to, it's going, you're going to have lots of chances uh, as the sun gets frothier and frothier. 
Besides the Aurora, uh, many of you may know there's lots of in, uh, important um, uh, consequences of the fact that the sun does throw crap at the Earth. And largely that has to do with our technology. So we have lots of satellites, uh, we have lots of radio communications, we have lots of sensitive electronics, even here on the ground. And when the sun begins to get very, very active, uh, it kind of constantly is bombarding the Earth's magnetic field. And in addition to making aurora, that causes a lot of, as we say in physics, electromagnetic effects. And those electromagnetic effects can have important consequences for lots and lots of the technology uh, that we have here on the Earth. Um, so I just saw a report today, I haven't had time to go to, to go read about it, but uh, several of the Starlink satellites were thrown off uh, by a geomagnetic uh, a, a solar event here just in the last few days. So, so it definitely happens. Uh, there are famous examples of consequences on the ground where it's blown out power systems. Uh, it's done all kinds of different things because our society is very susceptible in this technology right now to this kind of solar weather, as we call it. Okay. Okay. So uh, I got. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, Aurora on other planets, and then we'll tie off for the day. But are there any questions right here in the middle that I should take, Grace, or shall we push to the end? There are a few questions um, that maybe we could stop for um, right now. Um, Tony asks, why does nitrogen and oxygen have different colors at different altitudes? Ah, yeah. So that's a good question. So. Um, Actually, I don't think I know the answer off the top of my head. I should know the answer to that, but let me tell you what I think it is. It's one of two things. It's either the energy delivered to the atoms at the higher and lower altitudes is different. So that corresponds to different levels of light, or it's that there's different molecular forms of the atoms at those altitudes. So, so I, I don't know for oxygen, but certainly for, uh, sorry, I don't know for nitrogen. For oxygen, you can have molecular oxygen or you could have like ozone um, at, and those occur at different altitudes in the Earth's atmosphere and their signatures look different. And I don't remember what the difference in the nitrogen colors is, but um, if you get, if you grab a book on Aurora, they will remind you, remind me, remind you of, of what the right answer to that question is, but I think it's one of those two things. That's a really good question. I, I, I should have looked that up before I talked to you. Um, thank you. Um, uh, somebody else asked, um, Eileen asked, what time of year is best for, is there a time of year when there's likely to be more activity? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So the answer to that is no, because the, the amount of activity is really linked to the sun, right? Mm -hmm. And the sun doesn't care what the seasons on the earth are. So, you know, um, the, the, the real answer to that question, if, if your goal is to see the aurora, is that often it's easier in the winter because the nights are longer. And so anytime the aurora are active, you have more hours of dark to go out and see them. During our summertime, right, it's light until 9 p.m. and then it starts getting bright at like 4 a.m. So the nights here in the Northern Hemisphere are shorter. But if the aurora happened to be active, the right thing to do is to go to the Southern Hemisphere during our summer. And then you can see them by, by living in the Southern Hemisphere during their winter when their nights are longer. So. Okay, so a question that came in from Mike, is it easier to see the aurora in winter or summer? The answer would be the winter because the night's longer. Because the night's longer, but yeah. harder because you got to bundle up and you got to stand outside in the cold. <laughs> so I've seen the aurora in both the summer and the winter. And, and my, in my memory, the primary difference is in the summer, I'm always seeing them at one, two in the morning because, you know, that's when it's darkest, so... Okay, one, one more question um, before before we go back to your presentation. Um, this is a question from Joyce. It, this is a testament to the quality of photographs that you're showing. She says, does the aurora really look like these pictures or have the pictures been enhanced? Ah, that's, that's an excellent question. So I will show you a picture of this here at the end. Um, so photography is much better at capturing color than your eye is. Right. So so in Aurora photographs, the color is always more intense than your eye will see to your naked eye. That being said, when the Aurora are really active and really bright, you can detect differences in colors. I've seen red Aurora. I've seen blue Aurora. I've seen green Aurora. But 
they are not nearly as intense as like this picture behind me because a photograph photographs are just much better at, at capturing that color. It's not enhanced. It's just that they're dumping more of the colored light onto the film and it builds up to make it look brighter. But if the, if the Aurora themselves are bright enough, you can see that you can distinguish the colors in them. Fascinating. So do get out there and try to take photos. Do get out there and try and take um, photos. And I'll show you some examples here yeah. in a minute. So. Or videos? Uh, actually, that's a good question. I, I, so I'm going to show you some videos of Aurora that have been taken, uh, but largely the kind of videography that I'm showing you right now um, has traditionally been done by taking short photographs and then linking them together in videos. So I don't know if you actually took a video camera out, if you could see the Aurora or not. I'm going to guess that modern video cameras, maybe you could. Right? It's just like your phone technology is getting better. Modern video cameras are certainly better than those clunky things that you know we had when Grace and I were kids in the 80s. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Okay, okay. So here, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about Aurora on other worlds, and then we'll uh, we'll call it an evening and take more questions. So we definitely see Aurora on other planets. If you think about what we just said caused Aurora, you need the sun a source of charged particles, you need magnetic fields, and you need atmospheres. And that is certainly not something that's unique to Earth. Uh, these are pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is a picture of the aurora on Saturn. Uh, you see, just like on the Earth, there is an aurora circle uh, near the pole of the planet, and that is from Saturn's magnetic field guiding charged particles in to where they collide with the Saturnian atmosphere. You see aurora on Jupiter, okay? And so the aurora on Jupiter are actually rather unique because uh, the largest source of charged particles on Jupiter is not from the sun at all, but is from Jupiter's inner, uh, innermost moon, Io, which is a very highly volcanic moon. It is constantly being squeezed and pressed by Jupiter's gravity and its volcanoes launch uh, material into uh, the area around Io and Jupiter, and much of that material is what's responsible for the uh, auroras on Jupiter. So that's kind of unique about Jupiter's. But you can only imagine the, the aurora on Jupiter's are enormously powerful. So if you could go to Jupiter on a, a travel trip, Right, so this is a popular thing to do these days in scientific illustration is imagine what travel posters to another world would look like. You can imagine, uh, you know, ballooning across the atmosphere of Jupiter and having a chance to see these uh, really remarkable and enormously bright aurora on another world, so. Curiously, we do also see Aurora on Mars. Now, this was, a, I don't know if it was a surprise, but it's, but it's a surprise based on the conversation you and I have been having. Because Mars, unlike the Earth, does not have a sustained magnetic field. One of the difficulties with imagining going to Mars and uh, exploring Mars in person is that there is not the protection on the surface of the planet that the magnetic field on Earth provides us. Um, and so there are not regular aurorae on Mars the way there are on Earth. However, Mars at some times in its past did have um, a magnetic field, and that magnetic field has largely now been frozen into the crust of the planet. And so there are regions on Mars where the magnetic field is strong. And if we watch, this is a picture of Mars in ultraviolet light, we will occasionally see the surface of the planet light up in ultraviolet light, which is the Martian aurora in this case. Okay, so it definitely happens on Mars as well. So, so the aurora are not something that is confined to Earth. As we become a spacefaring civilization, I imagine that this will be something that even our descendants will imagine going out for a weekend trip with the family to see the aurora wherever they may live in the solar system. So someone asked uh, just a minute ago, what does it look like to your eyes? So uh, this is a great set of pictures taken by a really great photographer named Mike Taylor. Uh, what you see here is on the bottom, what his camera captured. And then what he did in the top is he took the photographs, he put them into Photoshop, and then he adjusted the color balance so that it looked something much more similar to what he thought his eye could see. And so this is exactly the same pic 
pardon me, the exact same picture, but this is, I think, uh, across the top here, very typical of what I think the aurora looks like. You can definitely see uh, some color sometimes. So you can see the green here in this one in the upper right. Okay, here uh, you can see it's green, but mostly the aurora look very white. Okay, and that's very typical of how your eye responds to dim light. In dim light conditions, your eye's chemical reactions is dominated by the black and white balance uh, in your eyes. Uh, and then over here in the upper left, this is very typical of the kind of reddish and pinkish aurora that your eye can see. It's very definitely not white, but it's also not this flaming hot pink that the camera can see. Okay, so this is very typical of what uh, your camera sees versus what your eye sees, but you can definitely see this stuff going on. Okay, so to end here, I want to show you some movies of the Aurora, because one of the things that makes Aurora watching hard but also makes Aurora watching very rewarding is that they're not just static things. They are dynamic. They constantly change. Every time you see them, they're different. And if you watch them, even over the course of just a minute or two, they change and they can change dramatically. Okay. So the first movie, uh, this one is a time-lapse photograph. So it is not real time. It's over the course of maybe an hour or so. Uh, but if you watch, you can see how the Aurora grow and fade and how they appear to stream. You get kind of bright spots that move and undulate over the course of time. And you can see here when, when Aurora events are going on, if you're out watching them, you'll see this kind of changes in brightness across the whole sky. And uh, I've seen Aurora just like these here where when you're looking at them, you'll see the ribbons and then all of a sudden the sky will light up right above your head in places where you weren't even looking before. So often it's, uh, it's very good to just kind of keep your eye out all over the sky when you're actually watching the aurora. Okay, they are uh, very distinct and colorful. Uh, and so in, in events like this that are really bright, uh, these are the kinds of situations where you can very definitely see that sometimes they look bluish to your eye, sometimes they look greenish, sometimes they look pinkish, okay? Now, this is a time-lapse photograph, as I said, but we can do movies in real time. So this is a real-time uh, photograph, uh, sorry, real-time movie. So this is about the speed which uh, Aurora will often undulate and change as you're watching them in the night sky. And you can see that just standing here, you can imagine just watching this for 30 seconds, they constantly change and move. And very often that's the, the hint that, that clues you into, oh my gosh, I'm seeing the aurora. I've been out many times where I've seen some faint glow in the sky and I'm like, oh, it's light pollution from the city or it's a cloud or something. And then it starts moving or I notice that it's moving. And it's actually this kind of dynamic nature that often finally triggers your brain to say, oh my gosh, I'm seeing the aurora right now. I better get my aurora calling tree out and get everyone up so they can go see them too. So, so this is very typical. This, this particular movie is taken in Northern Canada. Um, and so you can get, a, a, get these, these aurora storms very often where they're directly over your head. And those are the ones that are often the brightest. And so uh, you, getting, getting to a place where the aurora oval is over your head is definitely the way to see super, super bright ones. Okay. And if you go to YouTube and just type in Aurora Borealis movies, there are like hours and hours and hours. You can binge watch this for longer than you can binge watch uh, Netflix. Okay. Okay, so let me leave you with a few uh, a few last thoughts, and then we'll call it an evening. So, so there are very few dynamic dynamic experiences, things that change rapidly and viscerally while you're watching them, uh, that you can have with the cosmos. Those of you who have gone out and done a little bit of stargazing, the constellations are very static. They are definitely beautiful and awesome to look at. Uh, the moon and the planets are very bright, but they don't change, at least not rapidly. You look at them now, you look at them a half hour later, they look just like they did when you started the evening. But the aurora are different. They are very dynamic. They give you the sense that they are alive and, and doing something. Uh, and so it is a very different experience, a very different connection to the sky to be watching the aurora than it is to watch many of the other things that we see. 
So uh, if you head north uh, to Canada, Alaska, Scandinavia, you definitely will have uh, a good chance of seeing them. Uh, but as we've, we've mentioned several times here in the uh, times of year when the nights are long, so February and March are usually good bets uh, when it's clear. Uh, and when it's actually dark, those are always going to be the things that increase your opportunity to see them. You do need the sun to be active, and the sun is increasing its activity over the next few years. So if this is something that you would like to experience, you should definitely uh, be thinking about ways you can get yourself out to someplace dark and have the opportunity to see them, because it is truly a spectacular experience. So I will leave you then with just a few books to uh, read and uh, learn about. So uh, there have been a lot of books that are written about uh, the Aurora themselves, the what they are and the physics behind them. There's been a few books written about the sun and the uh, space weather, as we call it, uh, the sun's uh, uh, influence on the earth through the solar wind and these uh, big solar storms that it launches off. Uh, and then there have been uh, a lot of kind of neat historical books uh, written about our understanding of the secrets of the aurora and how we came to that understanding okay so uh, i will leave you with those books and i will say thank you very much for your attention and i am happy to take questions for as long as grace is willing to let us take questions um, there there's tons of questions and we won't be able to get to them okay all. So, we'll, we'll take as many as we want <laughs> okay um for those of you whose questions don't get asked, asked answered i'm sorry but um but we're trying um pamela would like to know uh what happens if you look through at an aurora through um a telescope is it is it better uh -huh. than, than or done with the naked eye or what yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, so uh, this picture here, I think, is a is a good example. So, if you look at the scale that the aurora covers, it's an enormous part of the sky, right? So, if you were to hold your hand out at arm's length and spread out your fingers, right, so to make a big five, right, that that aurora there covers, you know, laying your hands out side by side, four or five hand spans across the sky. By contrast, if you point a telescope up here in the sky, you're gonna see something on the scale of one of these small dots. And so what you lose by looking at the aurora through a telescope is you lose that kind of big picture, gigantic event view of it that you have. So, so definitely the way to see aurora is, is with your naked eye, not through the kind of narrow confines of a telescope. Okay, thanks. Uh, Joanne says, I saw an aurora from very far north, north of Prudhoe Bay. It was making a crackling and hissing noise, as I recall. Yeah. What was that? Yeah, so aurora, there have been uh, people, people often report that they can hear noise from aurora. Uh, that is because this is a magnetic and electrical phenomena. And uh, when these charged particles go into the earth, they do set up electrical currents in the earth. The charged particles do combine and move around and collide. And uh, it's been a long time since I've read about the crackling, but it happens something like a hundred to a thousand meters off the earth or something like that. So people standing on the ground often do report that they can hear that, hear that crackling noise. Yeah. So I've never heard it, but, uh, but, but I really want to because it sounds awesome. <laughs> Yeah, very cool. Um, okay, um, are there any colors that Aurora cannot be? Oh, uh, that is a good question. Um, so, 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 so the colors of the Aurora are related to the molecules that are generating the light. Okay, and then what your eye perceives as color is not just the pure colors, but it's the mixture of all those colors from the light. So, so I think the right answer to that is you're confined to the colors that the atoms, uh, the molecules can make by releasing that energy they gain from the charging with the electrons. And so, um, uh, there is certainly a finite number of colors, but what your eye's ability is to distinguish or your camera's ability to distinguish that is probably, um, is probably uh, hard to discern. So yeah, I, I would say there's a finite number, but it's for all practical purposes, probably infinite. So yeah, <laughs> that, 
That's a good question. <laughs> I'll think about that a little more. I don't, I don't know what the right way to answer that question is. There's a physics way and then there's a what do I perceive way, right? So, so that's where the ambiguity is in my head. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. Um, woo, um, just lost it there. Um, yeah, there, uh, we're going to take two more questions. One is, um, um, do, um, does climate change, is it going to have any effect on the worry? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, so I don't know that I have read anything about the impact of climate on the aurora. Um, the place where it will definitely have impact, if it does have impact, is on the uh, molecules that are dominant in our atmosphere, um, and also on the, the kind of overall density of particles that get encountered in the atmosphere. So um, the, the light that you see is coming from the chemical makeup of the, uh, of the atmosphere, the molecules that make it up. And if you change that chemical balance, I can imagine the colors themselves will change. Um, th that being said, probably the most influential thing that's going to happen to the um, uh, to the aurora is the Earth's magnetic field is constantly changing. But the geomagnetic changes in the Earth right now, there are definitely changes happening. And we and there geologically, there have historically been changes happening. But I don't think those changes are connected to climate change. They're, they're connected to the tectonic activity of the Earth. So that will certainly have effect on the aurora if you and I could live hundreds of thousands of years to see it. Uh, but, but as far as climate changes is, is concerned, I think the dominant effect that that, that would have any change if there's a change at all is in the chemical composition of the atmosphere. Excellent, thank you. Um, and finally, uh, Bob says, uh, can you share some of the Aurora forecast URLs that you use? And saying that, I, I, in, the best way to do this might be, I can send a follow-up email to everyone who registered for this program. So if Dr. Larson sends me some of the URLs, I could send it to everybody. No. Are you willing to do that? I, I can certainly do that. Yeah, okay. I, I will. I Thank will pick you. a few and send it to you. Um, I will okay. say uh, I'll send Grace a couple of websites that that are useful, um, and I'll send her at least the names of the Aurora apps that I have on my phone. Uh, so I'm an iOS user. So uh, sorry, Android users, but if you go to your Android app store um, and just ask for Aurora Forecast, you'll you'll find some there that you can use. But I'll send I'll send Grace the ones that I use and sites that I know of to post and and send out to folks. Great. Thank you very much. That, that'll be, it'll be a day or two and it'll, okay. include, that we'll, I'll include the link to this video. So if you want to share it with people who weren't here, you can do that. Um, okay. Thank you so very much, Dr. Shane Larson. Um, as always, a joy to have you with us. Okay. Thank time. you so much. Yeah. Thanks Good everyone night, for everyone. coming. Have a great evening. Be safe. <laughs>